The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. God's word for our focus is that first, or no, excuse me, the gospel lesson uh, from Luke chapter 18. We'll be reading those words throughout our meditation today. I don't know if you're into decorating your home with motivational quotes or not, but I feel like there's maybe one that all of us should have hanging somewhere in our house. It doesn't matter what the background is. It probably varies from where you buy it. If you buy it on Amazon, it probably has the nice mountain background. Or if you buy it on Pinterest, it's probably got an ocean. Or Etsy, there's a sunset. Whatever. That's fine. Get whatever matches your decor. That's not the important thing. What is important is the phrase. This motivational quote. And, and here's the one that I'm talking about. I've learned that every great achievement once considered impossible. Oh, isn't, that, isn't that great? A man named H. Jackson Brown wrote this quote in his New York Times bestseller that you've all seen in bathroom magazine racks everywhere. Life's little instruction book. <laughs> yes, it's unfortunate that that's where we usually see it, but it is a pretty good quote, isn't it? It's such a good quote because he's right. Think about Circumnavigating the globe. Ah, impossible, they said, until Magellan did it in the 1500s. Or human flight. Impossible until the Wright brothers took off in Kitty Hawk. Four-minute mile, never. Until Roger Bannister did it in the 50s. Space flight, impossible. Until the Soviets did it in the early 60s, and then us. The CU Buffs football team winning a football game in 2022. Impossible, they said, until last weekend. Cal came to town. We got one. (laughs) Yeah, this quote is motivational because we love this kind of stuff. You tell human beings that they can't do something. You tell human beings something's impossible, and we will say that. We will think, and we will work, and we will try until we turn the impossible into an achievement, right? And so that's why I think this kind of caught on, because this really captures the human spirit. Well, today, we're going to put that human spirit to the test, because we're going to take a look at a project that the, that the human spirit has been trying to flip from impossible to achievement for a long time, probably longer than any of the things that I've mentioned. In fact, It's the project of trying to get back what we've lost in the beginning. Talking about eternal life with God. Now that is a project, right? In the human spirit, it drives it nuts because why is it impossible? Why can't we just think and work and try and achieve it? Is this something that truly is out of our reach? Something outside of ourselves? Well, today we want to think about all those questions. We want to get into this Gospel of Luke and see if we can discover how we can make the impossible possible when it comes to eternal life. So let's let's read the first uh, verses here. A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You should not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. Let's stop right there. There it is. Right? Uh, What must I do to inherit eternal life? There is the project of all projects. Eternal life. Life, And I call it the project of all projects because this is something that is on people's minds their entire lives. It may not come out always. It may not seem like it, but it will eventually come out, especially in times of urgency. Think about the kinds of things that people say when they're facing death, and you will hear this kind of a thing. I'll use an example. I'll use the example of a respected and renowned scientist, Stephen Hawking. 
If there's anybody who gave the impression that he didn't care about this eternal life project, it was him. He was a devout atheist. But before he died, he said this, As for life after death, I believe the brain is like a computer that will simply shut off. There's no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. It's a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. I find that interesting. Why did he have to talk about afterlife if he didn't believe in it? He didn't talk about Bigfoot. He didn't talk about UFOs. Other fairy stories. But he had to talk about eternal life. Why? Because even though he didn't want it to be, it was on his mind. It is on everybody's mind. And I bring all this up to show us that this event that we're looking at in Luke is as real and as relevant as it gets. Here is a guy with eternal life on his mind. He's got questions about it. And this, this account is recorded in all the other Gospels as well. And so we see from those other accounts that this was a matter of urgency. In the Gospel of Mark, we see that this man ran to Jesus, fell on his knees before Jesus. Why? Had he just come back from the doctor with a, a devastating diagnosis? Had, had he experienced some horrible life experience? I don't know. But what I do know is that this question was different from all the, a lot of the other questions that Jesus was asked. A lot of times a question was asked to trap him, to trip him up. But this has urgency. This has sincerity. Eternal life was on the forefront of this man's mind, and he wanted some certainty. I find it interesting that he didn't have that certainty because I'm guessing he'd been working on this project, this eternal life project, for a long time. His whole brief life. I mean, look at what he said. Honoring marriage and sexuality? He did that. Respecting life? Perfect record. Respecting other people's personal property? Check. Honoring father and mother, it had, it had been a pleasure for him. He didn't even gossip, for goodness sakes. False testimony. This was as respectable and honorable and nice young man as you'd ever meet. And so you would think that he'd have some certainty by the way everybody thought about him, right? And even more than that, it says he was a ruler. Probably a ruler of the synagogue, and so he knew the scriptures. I'm sure he had a, a passage that tried to give him certainty. Uh, Leviticus 18.5 says, Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live. It's no wonder why he answered the way he did really quickly. Oh, Jesus, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Can't you hear the, the desperate plea for hope here? He just wants confirmation from Jesus. He's on the right path. He wants certainty. But it just seems like he doesn't have it. Why? I'll tell you why. Look where his focus was. His focus was on the what of eternal life. The what of eternal life. Uh, in the passage, he said, uh, go back. And so he was focused on the what of eternal life. Uh, what must I do? All these things I have done. He was focused on the what of eternal life. And that's not a good place to be. That's a horrible place to focus if you're looking for certainty with eternal life. Have you ever tossed rings over glass milk bottles? Have you ever thrown a baseball at stacked cans? Have you ever tried to hang on to a rope ladder that's suspended sideways and try not to fall off? You know what I'm talking about, right? Those are carnival games. And those carnival games, those are money-making traps because they make you overestimate your chances to win, right? That's what focusing on the what of eternal life does to a person. Just when you think you have a chance, reality strikes. And that's what happened for this rich young ruler. Jesus said, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. This has been misapplied so often to just rail on 
the blessings God gives and wealth. Are they dangerous? They can be, like we talked about in the first lesson. But, but think about what Jesus is saying here. Jesus isn't saying, oh, there's just, there's just one little thing that you've overlooked, and if you get this one, you've got it. Keep going. That's not what he's saying. Because there's no command in the Bible to not be wealthy. There's no command in the Bible that you have to give everything away. So what Jesus was doing here was exposing that carnival trick behind focusing on the what of eternal life. The truth is, no matter how hard this man tried, no matter how nicely he behaved, he would always be lacking something in regard to God's perfect standards. And in this case, this young man happened to be lacking the ability to let go of his earthly treasure and security and cling to God alone. To find his security, to find his treasure in God. He was focusing on the what of eternal life. And that's what made him walk away sad. Because Jesus says it, the what is impossible with people. So this brings up the question that I want you to really wrestle with this morning. What is your impossible? You know what I mean by that. This young man who was nice and honorable, he had an impossible. I guarantee that these nice, honorable people that have gathered here today have an impossible as well. Yes, you are here to fall before Jesus and worship. That is a good thing. You're here to listen to Jesus' powerful words. That is a great thing. But as you're listening to Jesus' words, make the tough evaluation like this young man had to do. What is it? What is it that has your focus? What is it that has your heart? What is your treasure? What is your security? What is that one thing that you have your fingers so tightly wrapped around that even though you do love Jesus and even though you try to live a thankful life to him, if you were asked to give that thing up, you would walk away sad. What is it? Because if you're holding on to that, then you are not holding on to the eternal life that God alone, God alone gives. What is your impossible? Meditate thoughtfully on these words of Jesus in Luke and allow him to expose your impossible. Why? Because it's when we focus on the what of eternal life that we will walk away sad. We don't want that to happen. So as we think about all that, maybe we need to <laughs> readdress that motivational quote that I wanted you to hang in your house. Remember it? I've learned that every great achievement was once considered impossible. Maybe the problem is I, I had it all mixed up. I was thinking that impossible was, was the challenge to overcome this morning. And maybe it is when you're talking about space travel and, and a four-minute mile. But I think when it comes to the project of eternal life, it's not the impossible that's the challenge. It's another word in this motivational statement. I think it's the word achievement. That's what we need to overcome, right? Can we do it? And if achievement is the, the challenge, then we, we've been asking the wrong questions. This young man was asking the wrong questions. And so we need someone to ask the right questions, to shift the focus. And now enter Jesus. Right? You've, you've probably noticed that I've intentionally left out some of the parts of the text so far in our study. So let's go back. Remember the question that this young man asked that was so urgent? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And do you remember how Jesus initially answered that? With another question. Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Isn't that an unusual way to answer a young man's urgent and sincere question about eternal life? 
There's only one reason that you ever answer a question with a question. And the reason is to shift the focus, to, to get someone thinking in a completely different way. And so that's what Jesus is doing here. I think this is tricky, but this is so important if you can follow me here. This man was focused on defining good with his actions. So what Jesus is doing with his words here is he's shifting that focus to defining good with a person. Do you see the difference? Jesus is saying that there can be no consideration of the concept of good apart from God, who is alone perfectly and completely good. And so, by pointing out the fact that this young man called Jesus good, Jesus was forcing him to consider that maybe, maybe Jesus was God. And if Jesus is God, then maybe the good of eternal life has more to do with the good of Jesus than the good of his actions. What Jesus was trying to do was get the man to think and focus on the who of eternal life, not the what. So that was the first attempt. And I really think, because Jesus kind of redirected it, he, he probably paused. And he had thought about that a little bit. The who, not the what. But he goes back to the what the shells and the shell knots that he'd kept since a boy. So how did Jesus answer that one? Jesus said, sell everything, give, and follow me. Emphasis on me. See, this young man had been defining treasure with things. Now, Jesus' word helped him to shift that focus and start defining treasure with a person, with Jesus. You see, someone can have all the things the world has to offer in their hands, but they still have nothing if they don't have Jesus. So Jesus, again, was trying to shift the man's focus to the who of eternal life. There was one more attempt. The young man kind of gave up for a while. He, he walked sad, walked away sad. But the disciples took up the project. And they looked at that nice young man and they couldn't believe it. You're telling me it's more possible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than this man, this nice, honorable, wonderful man to be in heaven? Then they looked at themselves and they thought, what about us? Man, we've given up everything. And so they challenged Jesus. They said... Who then can be saved? And how did Jesus answer that? Again, pointing to himself. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And so he's right back to where he started. Do you see how Jesus constantly directed it back to him, away from the what to the who? Why do you ask me? Only God is good. Come follow me. All things are possible with God. He is Directing away from the what to the who of eternal life. And I think there is where you see the beauty in Jesus' teaching. And that's where you have the, the comfort and the encouragement today. It's, it's true for you too. God alone is good. God alone is able. And out of his grace, God has chosen to pick up this eternal life project and accomplish it. In Jesus. That is his greatest desire. That is his ability. God does the impossible. God, like the kids said, God can make a camel go through the needle if he wanted to. And God can do greater things than that. God could come down to this earth and live perfectly for all the things that we lack. God could live on this earth and then die on the cross to pay for all the mighty tries of ours that have fallen short. God can take hearts that are turned away from him and clinging to other things and release it and make him cling to him alone. You see, 
The eternal life project is complete and it is satisfied in Jesus. The who of eternal life is what makes it possible, and that is Jesus. And he did. And it is finished. One last piece of motivational artwork for you. Maybe we won't hang the other one. How about this? <laughs> okay, that's a little strange, right? There's no words. But let me explain why I mean that you might want this hanging in your house. I don't know if this is true, so I will introduce it this way. I have heard it said that there is an easy way to trap a raccoon if you want to do such a thing. And you, what you do is you take a box and you... Um, put something that a raccoon really likes in there and you make a hole just big enough so it can fit its open hand through there. And what it will do is it will grab that and once its hand is closed, it can't pull it out. And it won't pull it out because even though it could drop it and open his hand and pull it back out, it would rather cling to the thing than be free. So maybe you want to hang this in your house so that you remember don't be like that. Don't be like the rich young man, right? We all have things that we cling to that make the eternal life project impossible. Something that we treasure, something that we find our security in that is not God. It's the what of eternal life. Jesus' encouragement and his comfort for you today is this. Let go of the what and cling to the who. And that is Jesus. And Jesus alone is life. Amen. May he who began that good work of faith in us carried on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing another song, and it just really... Uh, reinforces that, that point that our worth is not in the things that we own and we cling to. It's in God and God alone.